Good morning and welcome to this webinar. Today we will be covering the topic of collection storage and organization. So welcome and um, I see there are people who are already greeting in the chat. So I guess you can join them. Um, today's webinar will be covered by Michelle, Michelle Hema, whom you, you all know, the NSCF lead. So apart from Michelle, we also have in the background Chanel, who's helping with the technical aspect of the webinar. For the webinar guidelines of, for engagement, just before we get started, just so that everyone knows what to expect or, or what's expected of them. We would like you to please keep your contributions helpful and considerate of everyone. You can use the chat to say hello. Yes, let's get it going. <laughs> it's, it's busy in the chat. So thank you so much for doing that. So let's, let's greet each other there and just let us know where you are joining us from, which institution. We know we are a network, so we have over 16 institutions. So lots of people from different institutions in the chat. You can also use the Q&A box to add your questions there. Obviously, as the webinar will be going on, you might find that you have a question about something. Before you forget that question, just put it in the Q&A box to keep it safe because there will be discussion going on in the chat box. So if you put your question there, you might find that we don't see your question. So just to make sure we get it, use the Q&A box. Due to time constraints that, that we might come across, we might not be able to answer all questions. So we ask that um, the questions that we don't get to answer, you just go ahead and add them in the webinar link. So we're going to post this webinar or the recording of it on our YouTube channel. And it's also streaming live on Facebook. So either YouTube or Facebook will be fine and we'll make sure that we get your question answered. Please also don't forget to visit our website, nscf.org.za. If you go to the resources tab and you go to uh, collections management. That's where you'll find all information about this course there, the recordings, the, um, the presentations, information about the course, every single thing will be there, even the assignments. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm now handing over to Michelle to get us started. And um, yeah, <laughs> thanks Michelle. Okay, thanks, Kulu, and good morning, everyone. So today's webinar is part of the collection management and curation course that we're running through the NECF, and it's also part of the implementation of the curation and collection management manual. So today, what we're going to be covering, it, it's sort of a continuation from the previous topic, which was about collection care and curation policy. And today we're going to be looking in more detail at the storage standards. So the first is storage environment. So the storeroom and the environmental conditions, and then also storage infrastructure. So talking about cabinets and shelving and storage containers, bottles, boxes, linings, um, and then um, we're going to also talk about collection organization. So how should collections be organized and how do you record the location of specimens? So we're not going to talk about procedures and processes for dealing with storage. We'll talk about those in later webinars. We're not talking about topping up ethanol and we're not talking about pest management. Those will be dealt with later. It's really just looking at at what are the, the storage standards for, for our collections. And we're also not going to be talking about scientific curation and making taxonomic changes in any detail. We'll also deal with that later. 
So we've got quite a lot to cover today. So next slide, please. The collection storage is a really critical part of protecting our collection. So the Society for the uh, Preservation of Natural History Collections, what they say and what we've put is in our, in our manual as well, two points that are really relevant. And these are the main aim of what we're trying to achieve with our collection storage. So collection objects must be protected against unnecessary damage, loss or alteration that might affect future research potential. So protecting them against unnecessary damage or loss. And then every effort must be made to minimize the level of risk facing the collection objects as a result of storage and use. Next slide. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to minimize the risk and we're trying to protect against unnecessary damage. So in previous webinars and topics and in the manual, we talk about these 10 agents of deterioration and loss. And you've seen this picture many times before. So if you think about the way we store collections, the room, the cabinets, the shelving, the bottles, the boxes, which of these agents of deterioration can we address by the storage? And you can put it in the chat box. So physical forces, disassociation, incorrect humidity, incorrect temperature, light and UV, pollutants, pests, water, fire, and criminals. Which of those can be addressed? and prevented or mitigated by the way we store. And we'll give you a minute there, just think about it. And you can put it into the chat box. Needs one person to get started. Everything, Liesl says, thank you, Liesl. Anybody else, all of them? Criminals, water, light, UV pests, temperature, right? All of them. Domain says pests, water, fire, says Henry. Anybody else? All. And then let's see where all. So, yeah, I think you're right. So, if you think about it, the way we store the collections, the temperature, the humidity, moisture, how well secured they are, all of these, maybe disassociation. So disassociation is where um, you separate, you lose the information. And we'll talk about that a bit later, but yeah, everything. And that just shows how critically important storage is. So today's topic is a really, really important one for protecting our, our collections. Next slide. Okay, so also in the manual, you may have seen this diagram. And what it shows is that there's a multi-layered protection of an object. So if you think of a specimen in your collection, whether it's a herbarium sheet or pinned insect or a bottle of mites, is several layers and all of these can be considered as important for storage. So there's the building, the outer walls of the building. Then there's the storeroom, so the inner walls surrounding your collection. Then there's the storage, so this is your cabinets or a safe or a, um, shelving. And then there's the container housing the object, so this might be um, a drawer or a bottle. And then there's the packaging or wrapping, and then the object inside of that. So if you think about all these layers, you, you, you know, they're all relevant for storage. Next slide. So in the, when we talked about the curation policy, we talked about some policy points. And these are the ones that are relevant for collection storage areas. So a policy statement is that collection objects should be stored and displayed only in conditions suitable for their preservation. But what does that really mean? So there's more policy points under that. 
collection storage areas must be a pest-free environment that's climatically controlled to avoid fluctuations in temperature and humidity. The collection storage area must be used exclusively for storing collections, separate from other uses, including office space and research and work areas. The area must be protected from fire by having appropriate fire protection, detection and control systems that are tested and maintained regularly. The storage area must be secure and structurally sound and wet collections should be kept separate from dry collections. So those are sort of policy statements, but now if we go further into the, the detail of those, next slide. If we look at what do we mean by the, the specifics, so of course the storm structure must be sound. So if you've got leaks in the roof, if you've got rising damp, and if you've got windows that don't close properly and doors um, that also can't be locked, then there's going to be a problem um, for, for everything. And it's very difficult to maintain temperature at a stable temperature, a stable level. If your windows are enclosed properly, that there's leaks, you just you can't manage things properly. So in the manual, what it says is that temperature of storm should be between 16 and 22 degrees. So the colder the better. And that's for all temp, all collections. Cold is good. Um, and it doesn't mean that it can fluctuate in this range. It's very important that the temperature is maintained at a stable temperature. It's, it's at a stable, um, it's set and it may, it's maintained. If you have fluctuations in temperature, it can actually destroy specimens because they expand when it gets warm, they contract when it gets cold, and that eventually can fracture, um, especially hard structures. But even uh, herbarium specimens will be um, impacted. Bones, shells um, will really um, be damaged by constant increase and decrease in temperature. And then obviously, if the temperatures go too high, you start to get deterioration. So you get pests that love warm temperatures, you get increased evaporation. And you get a whole lot of different chemical reactions that start to happen and have all happen quicker at higher temperatures. For humidity, it's not that important for wet collections, but for dry collections, it's really critical. So insect and insects, skins, bones, eggshells, um, and, and any uh, mounted plants or herbarium specimens. And what the manual recommends in line with global standards is that the humidity should be maintained at between 45 and 55 um, percent. And that's really to prevent damp and high humidity that cause mold and that damages and destroys collections very quickly. And then also moisture reacts with various materials to form damaging compounds. Air circulation is important for preventing damp and mold, but it can't be through opening doors and windows because then you're allowing pests and dust and dirt in and affecting the temperature. So it should really be part of your climate control ventilation system. And then also every collection storeroom should have at least temperature monitoring data loggers set up that are checked regularly. But if humidity is an issue, then you should also have a humidity monitoring system. And those should be checked. And then obviously if there's any problems, if you pick up fluctuations, then you can address them. So those are the standards for your storage area. Next slide. So this just shows um, mold on the walls, rising damp with mold and leaking roofs. And I know that a lot of the collections are stored in old buildings where there's an ongoing challenge with the, with the infrastructure. Next slide. Okay, so now we're going to do a poll. We always do this just to get people involved. So you will answer yes or no, or I don't know, I'm uncertain, or this isn't relevant for my collection. Um, and this can be the collection you're responsible for, you work in. So the storeroom has well-functioning, reliable temperature control. Humidity is kept between 45 and 55%. 
is an air ventilation system, so an automatic one in the storeroom. There's a data logger to record temperature. Um, and then the last one is there's a data logger to record humidity. When you say yes, no, uncertain or not relevant. Okay, Fulu or Chanel, whoever's running the poll, you can open. So it has the results. So the storeroom has a well-functioning temperature control system. So 55% um, of people say yes. And then 38% say no and 7% uncertain. So it's about half, half the collections. The second one, the humidity is kept between 45 and 55%. So yes, 31%, a third. No, 29%. Um, and not relevant. So it may not be relevant for a wet collection. So if you work in a wet collection storm, you might not need to actually maintain the humidity at any level. So it's about a third have humidity control. There's an air ventilation system. So yes, so quite a lot, almost 70% have got some kind of a ventilation system and only 21% don't. And then there's a data logger. So this is also about a third have a data logger to record temperature. And we've been trying to promote this through the NSCF, um, getting everyone to have a, a data logger. They're not very expensive. And then half don't have. And then um, for the humidity, again, about more than half um, of the collections don't have um, data loggers for humidity. Okay, so that's quite interesting. It shows about half are sort of on track. All right, so let's continue. Next slide. Thank you for inputting there. Okay, so a little bit more about the storage areas. And this is about light and exposure to outside. So the recommendation is that the storeroom must be kept dark. So light damages specimens and fades labels. So light shining into a collection storeroom is very damaging. It may not be as bad if all the specimens are kept in cabinets that are kept closed. The windows should be covered, for example, by blinds that are basically kept down most of the time. Uncovered windows contribute to temperature fluctuations and allow light into the storeroom. So the ideal is actually to have no windows in your storeroom, um, just a ventilation system. But if you do have windows, you should keep them covered. Lights, so you do need lights in there. They must allow work to be done safely and accurately. So there should be, it should be good lighting. You often need to read small labels. Um, but remember that light switches must be outside the storeroom, especially for rooms that have a high fire risk, like wet collections. And then doors and um, windows must be sealed. So well sealed, they must close tightly and they must be kept closed all the time. So you open the door to go in, you close it behind you. And when no one's in there, the door is kept, kept closed. And it should seal at the bottom and all the way around. And that really prevents um, pests and dust and dust and climate fluctuations. Right, next slide. And then obviously a really important one, we've talked about this a lot with the risk management and the health and safety. So just in terms of the collection storage area, uh, there should be some kind of fire prevention. So a fire door will stop fire getting into that room if it comes from somewhere else. Smoke detectors are really important in the storage room. And it should be linked to an alarm which links to a fire department and whoever else is responsible for, for the um, building. And then fire suppression systems, I know that these are a challenge because they're expensive and it's getting the, the right kind can be outside of um, a lot of institutions' budgets. A fire extinguisher is great outside the storeroom. Um, it must be the right Kind and it's fine for small fires, but if nobody's on site, so often fire will happen at night or over a weekend, what happens then? So you really do need an, some kind of automated system 
and water is fine for wet collections, but when it comes to dry collections, there should be some kind of a gas biosuppression system. Um, you must consider the impacts of, on the collection if the system discharges. So think about if you've got a sprinkler system and you've got dry collections, what would the impacts be? Um, also think about the costs. So I know that the gas fire suppression system at the National Herbarium is an amazing system, but if it discharges accidentally and these gas bottles have to be refilled, it's over 100,000 rand. So you've got to think about whether you can actually afford it. But something is, is needed. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we've got another poll here now. Um, so again, answer yes, no, or uncertain or not applicable. So the collection storeroom is kept dark unless someone is in there. The storeroom has no windows. The windows in the storeroom have blinds or some kind of other cover that keeps them blocked at all times. Windows and doors are always kept fully closed at all times. There is a fire door leading into the collection. There's a smoke detector in the storeroom. There's an automatic fire suppression system in the storeroom. So it will be quite interesting to see. These are more, a little bit more tricky. So you can open the poll, Chanel. So here again, you can think about the collection you work in and answer these questions or have a look. Okay, so here are the answers. So the, the storm is kept dark. So great, that's a lot. That's good news. 76% said yes. The collection, the storeroom has no windows. So most of you have windows. So 71% um, do have windows in the storeroom. And then the windows have blinds. So 51%, about half say yes. 27% say no. Some it's not relevant. Um, windows and doors are always kept fully closed. So that's great. 85% said yes, they're always kept closed at all times. Excellent. There's a fire door. So about 41% say yes, we do have a fire door. 51% say no. Smoke detector, very good. There's 83% say yes. I should have asked if it's um, connected to an alarm. And there's an automatic fire suppression. So almost half do have a, a fire suppression system, which is great. Okay, so thank you for that. So it's, it's pretty good, actually. Um, there's some institutions that need some upgrades, but yeah, looking, it looks good. Right, next slide. Okay, then another issue about the storeroom. Um, and this is a, becoming increasingly important is the security. So the entrance to the building, your outer layer of protection, obviously that needs to be secured in some way and it will depend on, on the type of institution that you are. But access to the actual collection storeroom, there should be some kind of lock there, whether it's a lock and key or a tag or a fingerprint, something like that, but it should be kept locked at all times. And then um, I think more and more people are starting to get security cameras, CCTV cameras. So security is an issue. All right, next slide. Okay, now we move to the next level. We've looked at the storeroom, um, but what about cabinets and shelving? So after lots of debate, the collection management and curation working group, they talked about this backwards and forwards, but eventually agreed that these should be metal. Um, I know that a lot of institutions have got uh, wood at the moment and um, some very high quality wood cabinets, but the ideal is that they should be metal. It limits fire impacts and water damage. It doesn't swell like wood does if it gets wet. Um, it's easier to clean and it doesn't give off volatile organic compounds. So wood does release compounds. If, it, if you have open shelving, there should be some kind of a restraining bar or barrier to prevent specimens falling off the shelves, so popping over. 
The shelves must be strong enough to bear the weight of specimens without buckling. So if you put too much, they might bend and buckle and eventually collapse. They should also be very well secured, fixed to something so that there's no risk of them falling over. And you should never pile things up too high on those shelves. If you use cabinets, they must have a sound, very tight door seal. So that um, just a, a simple closed cupboard isn't really going to help you with pests and temperature. If delicate specimens are in drawers, they must be cushioned from vibrations and drawers must open smoothly. So I'm sure the entomology people know that often those drawers get stuck and you should avoid that or fix it because that jarring will break insects. Um, accessibility of specimens is really important for monitoring. So you should be able to check them very quickly um, and caring for them. You shouldn't have to move a whole lot of specimens or bottles or boxes to get to others because every time you move something, you're shaking it and you can cause damage. Specimens should not be stored directly on the floor. And I know that this is a challenge, especially for the people who have huge fossils or huge um, skeletons or skulls. But on the floor, they're more vulnerable to pests and flooding and exposure to dust and dirt. And there's an increased risk of damage. People kick them, fall over them, pile things on top of them. So yeah, it should really be avoided. Next slide. Okay, so this, and some of you might recognize your collections, yeah, um, but this is just to show you and just look at this and see what you think about the shelving. So given what we've just said, look at it and look at that slide and say, that's good, that's right, oh, there's a problem. So become like auditors now. So you can see here, you can see the restraining bar in the um, picture on the right with the metal shelving. And there's that barrier just to prevent things from falling over and it's good they're not piled up on top of each other. But you can see some at the back there on the floor which is not ideal and the picture on the left you can see the wooden um, shelving and you can see it's even starting to bend a little bit to walk at the bottom because it's overloaded. Next slide. Okay, so here's some cabinets and you can see this is a metal cabinet on the left. The drawers are wood. I think that wood is, I think it's very difficult to find metal drawers. I think they're very expensive to get made. It may be better, but wood is okay. Um, so that's a, a good cabinet. And then obviously compact shelving like this, and this is actually at Ezeco. It's their new facilities, and you can see how amazing those well sealing compactors um, would be. And, this, and it even looks like some kind of a safety. The wide range of cabinets and shelving. Next slide. Okay, well, that one, some of you will recognize that's compactor shelving, and you can see again the restrainer on the, on the shelving. Not, everything's not piled up. That's incredible. I think that that is uh, Saeb, yeah, and hopefully they'll tell us a bit more about these amazing storage systems. Next slide. Okay, so now we talk about the actual containers, so the things that you put your specimens into. So we talk about wet collections first, and what we've recognized is that plastic is really not suitable. So containers must be clear glass. So if you've got any kind of, and I know that for big specimens, they're often in buckets, plastic buckets um, or tanks, and those eventually crack and it's very hard to, to monitor loss. So we must move away from plastic bottles, jars, files, tanks, buckets. And um, the right kind of lid is a, a polypropylene screw on lid and that they we can have them made to fit console glass jars and um, I know between Osisipo and Chanel they did a huge exercise I think Saib was involved in identifying somebody who can make these and we had um, a very large number made for, for a lot of different institutions. Um, small wet specimens so they should be in glass files with a polyester fiber plug 
And then obviously you put several of those into a large jar. For big specimens, if you've got a whole shark or big fish like Saib, then um, fiberglass tanks or stainless steel tanks with lids with very good seals. So the seals often perish because of the ethanol, and so you have to check them often. If you do use plastic <clears throat> for your large specimen containers, it must be high density polyethylene. So it's a special kind of plastic that doesn't, um, that isn't so quickly affected by ethanol. But UV light, so if the light shines on it, then it will cause deterioration of the plastic. So ethanol is corrosive to many common plastics and metals, even zinc, copper, rubber, glue, sealants, um, they, they often dissolve by ethanol. And some of you might have, I've got this picture at the bottom here, these old glass um, bottles with the glass stoppers, and then trying to get those stopper lids out can be an absolute nightmare. And some of you might even have these funny, sort of permanently sealed, glass containers that you have to inject the ethanol into to top up. Those are not really suitable. Okay, next slide. So here again, I'm asking you to look with an auditor's eyes. Can you see we've got metal shelving grates, but we've got plastic bottles. So that's a challenge. Those plastic lids I think you will know if you work in collections like this, they often split around the top. Next slide. Okay, here are some um, other pictures of wet collections. Good, they've got both got glass bottles, which is great. Metal lids, they um, are corroded by ethanol and they often get very, very fine holes in them as they rust from underneath and they lose ethanol. And again, if they're, if they're not the proper plastic jars, they do get lost. Next slide. Okay, here's an example of what we were talking about for very small um, specimens where you put them into a vial and then several vials into a bigger jar that's filled with ethanol. Um, and here again, we've got metal lids, so those would need to be replaced with proper screw-on plastic lids. Next slide. Okay, so these are the um, fiberglass tanks at Saib. So you can see the size of those, um, but that's the right kind of um, container for very big wet specimens. Next slide. Okay, so what about dry collections? So these really need to be protected from physical damage. So they're more um, vulnerable to, to um, bumping and breaking in the wet specimens um, and also dust and dirt builder. The dry specimens should be placed in some kind of a box or container and um, should really be on some kind of a lining, acid-free paper lining, or if it's very delicate, on some kind of a padding, so polyethylene padding. Um, skins should be in drawers and lined with acid-free paper, um, or on polyethylene foam lined specimen trays. So there's various um, approaches to this, but really the um, specimens should be in some kind of a container that protects them should be acid-free, should be cushioned. For very big skulls, bones, and fossils on an open shelf, sometimes it's unavoidable, but again, they shouldn't sit on the bare shelf, they should have some kind of a padding. And ideally, they should have some sort of a dust cover. Dust um, will accumulate. For anything that you, you do and you use glues or adhesives, you must check that it's archival grade. Other um, adhesives can cause a lot of damage. And for pin specimens, um, use only stainless steel pins. Otherwise, you get this verdigree damage back in the picture. So in the picture on the left there, you can see a dust cover for an open shell. Um, and that works well rather than trying to close close. Um, bigger specimens up. Next slide. So just a note about plastics. I mean, um, I know that um, plastics are cheap and they're easily available, 
and they're often just suitable plastic bottles, containers, linings, but be very careful of them. So never use PVC plastics for collection storage. They give off chlorine gas and that damages the, the specimens. They can also cause static electricity, which is very bad if you've got delicate pinned insects or other delicate um, objects. And then check there's only three types of plastics that meet preservation standards. That's polypropylene, polyethylene, and polyester. And you can buy these as thick or thin, soft, hard sheets, rolls, foams. So they come in a whole range of different forms. Um, but just check that they're free of any kind of other um, ad additives that can cause damage. And then be careful if you put anything into plastic bags or you cover um, specimens with plastic. If they're not fully dried when you do that, then you're going to get mold and, and rotten. So just be careful of, of using plastic. Next slide. Okay, so here's some examples, small mammal collection in wooden drawers. Um, it may be all that's available. If it's in a metal cabinet, that's good. But with a lining, and you can see the type specimen is sitting on lining. Um, and then on the far right, you can see pictures. So these are wooden um, uh, chunks. And in them are piled mammal skins, and that's really not a good way to store. Um, and they're piled up on each other. So that so that not only are the skins piled on top of each other in the trunk, the trunks are piled on top of each other. So you can imagine the challenge of having to check for pests or find something or just do monitoring there. Right, next slide. Okay, so this isn't a South African collection, but I just thought um, the way they protect the specimen from um, rolling around or being bumped or jarring or vibrations is really good. So you can see they've just used this um, polyethylene foam to surround each of the different parts of it and to hold it um, stable in that box. And that's very important when you've got delicate specimens because every time you open a drawer, they're going to bump against the sides. Right, next slide. Okay, so eggs. Also here you can see um, that the, each egg is in a little um, tray and it's there that's it's held quite firmly and it's also got bubble wrap at the bottom. I think a, a bubble wrap is, is okay plastic. Somebody would have to check. But at least it's got some cushioning and protection there. All right, next slide. Okay, then, um, you know, we talked about having big specimen bones and things sitting on the floor here. And these, I don't know if anybody can recognize what they are. The picture on the left. Let's have somebody tell us what these things are on the left here. Rhino skulls. Thanks, Greg. Rhino, right. Okay, so they look really funny. But they are rhino skulls and they attached to a sort of a metal frame and rack system. So they're not on the floor, which is good. And here's a whole lot that are sitting on a shelf. And you can see this is a wooden shelf. It's probably not ideal, but they've put some kind of cushioning or padding under those bones on the left. So you can see they're giving them some protection. Next slide. And here, this is also Ezeko. I mean, this is incredible. The people who work there will be familiar with it, but for those of us who just have been to visit, to see whale skulls is, is quite something. And again, these are massive, but they've had these um, stands for them built, so they're not sitting on the floor. Um, and they get a lot more protection on those on those stands. Next slide. Okay, so that's um, mostly animal collections. Some of it's relevant to, to plants as well. But for the herbarium specimens, um, these are the standards that are in the manual. So always use acid-free or carbon quality glue or thinly strip, uh, cut strips of um, pre-gummed linen tape. Or, putting your plant onto the board, the mounting board. And obviously that mounting board should also be um, acid-free. And then you use these acid-free boxes for bigger parts of plants that you can't mount onto a board. 
And what they say is that you should have a little packet for fragments on every sheet. And every time something breaks off of that plant specimen, it goes into that little packet. And then you have um, the um, sheets with the same species into a species folder and the um, same species in a genus in a genus folder. So those are just a, card, a thin card. Um, and then for some other types of, of plant collections like mosses um, and fungi and lichens, those should go into cotton packets, acid-free envelopes or boxes. So quite a different way of storing to, to animals. Next slide. Okay, and these, this shows um, herbarium collections. So there you can see a metal cabinet and you can see all your species or genus folders piled up here. And I think it's important to also say don't pile too many or never squash them. They're such delicate specimens. Yeah, you can see open shelving. So you can see what would the challenge with that be, open shelving like this. And here, this is also open shelving, but you can see that um, the one at the bottom on the right, there's plastic. So they've put the um, herbarium sheets into a plastic container. That will at least give them some protection from pests and dust buildup. All right, next slide. Okay, so here's another poll. So this one is a bit different. You're going to tick all the challenges that you have with meeting these standards for containers. So if you have wooden shelves, then you tick that. If you have wooden cabinets, you tick that. If you have um, shelves with no restraining border, then you tick that. Um, if you have dry specimens on open shelves with no dust protection, tick that. If you have no cushioning of specimens on shelves or in drawers or in boxes, you have plastic bottles or buckets for specimens, do you have metal lids on jars, um, do you not use archival quality paper boxes or adhesives, do you have specimens sitting on the floor, or do you have too many herbarium specimens piled on top of each other because you've run out of cabinets, basically? All right, let's see which of these are, are common and big problems. So Chanel's opened the poll so you can tick all of those that are relevant. Okay, there are the results. So wooden shelves, so if you've got wooden shelves, so not many, 21%. Wooden cabinets, lots, 51%. No restraining border, 21 um, Dry specimens on shelves without dust protection, so not too bad. No cushioning of specimens, again, not too bad, most people have. Plastic bottles and buckets, 44%, not too bad. Metal lids on jars, 41%. And then archival paper not used, so small. Most people do specimens on the floor, 30%. Too many herbarium specimens on top of each other, 28%. So you can see it's, it's um, probably the biggest, which is the most common, plastic buckets and bottles, and then wooden cabinets. And obviously to just discard all those cabinets and replace them with metal cabinets would be too expensive, and so it might be a matter of going forward, we buy um, metal cabinets. All right, thanks for that. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, and then just a short um, point about glass slides. So uh, most collections do have some. They should be stored flat um, to prevent slippage and running of the mounting medium. They should never be stacked on top of each other and they should be stored horizontally with the cover slip facing up. So you can see in the one, um, this, the picture on the left, that's what they should be stored like. I think the one on the right is what a lot of slides are stored um, like this in, in slide racks. It's not ideal. All right, next slide. I mean, yeah, next slide. <laughs> Okay, so what if my collection doesn't meet these standards? So you've set these very high standards. This is global practice. 
um, what am I going to do? So I think the first thing is to just see exactly where the challenges are and where the gaps are. So what are your, where are you not meeting the standards? And then do an assessment of what's needed to upgrade the collection so that it meets the storage standards. So how many bottles, how many glass bottles would you need? And how many of each different size? How many cabinets, what size? If people need to be moved out of the collection um, storeroom, they work there normally, how many of them? Are there um, alternative places for them to move to? Um, what climate control or fire systems are needed? And then once you've done that assessment, you can do a prioritization plan and list the items from most critical to least critical for protection of the collection. So how much risk is reduced if you do this? And it may be that your wooden cabinets come low on the list of priorities if they're good quality wooden uh, cabinets. Um, and then that fits into, once you've got that whole prioritization plan and you know how much of everything you need, you fit that into your curation plan. And we'll talk later in the, in the webinar series about curation planning, or it can go into your risk management plan. But the first step is to just know what the problems are. All right, so next slide. Okay, so that's collection storage dealt with. We're just going to look quite briefly at collection organization. And I think these are quite famous international um, collections, slides of collections, where you can imagine if you don't have a good system that everybody understands, organizing these collections, they become almost worthless. Next slide. Okay, so which of the agents of deterioration can be addressed by collection organization. So the way in which you organize your collection. So you can put it in the chat quickly. Okay, so it's the only specimens. Right. Okay, and so thank you. Okay, next slide. Right. So everyone's got that right. Okay, so there's no single correct way of organizing the collection. So um, different institutions use different systems, and that's fine. In some institutions, the collection, the collection itself, so collections are split up according to categories. So you can have marine invertebrates or aquatic organisms or wet arthropods, or by higher taxon. So you have an entomology collection, a mammal collection, a mollusk collection, a lepidoptera collection, a bryophyte collection. And then it really depends on the size and structure of the institution, the collection, and often it's historical. So there's no, again, the, even the types of collections are not set in stone. Within a collection, most commonly you would have your collection organized alphabetically by family, but some um, collections are organized phylogenetically by family. And then within a family, you have all the genera organized alphabetically. Within a genus, it's a species organized alphabetically. And then the specimens in a species, you can organize them by catalog number. So from lowest to highest catalog number. Or by country alphabetically, and then in a country province alphabetically, and then location. Some collections just have everything alphabetically by species. So it doesn't matter what genus they're in or what um, uh, family they're in, you just um, do it alphabetically by species. Next slide. So just some important points. It doesn't really matter what system you use, but remember that the simpler the system, the easier it is to use and to maintain. So if you start having too many classification levels in the organization, so subfamilies and tribes and subgenus, it becomes very messy when those levels change. Somebody does some research and finds that this is not valid or this is now um, a different level. Um, or when species are moved from one taxon to another, so it becomes very difficult to maintain. And remember that the main purpose of having a system is to prevent loss of specimens and to save you time when you need to find something to send out on loan or for a researcher, or you want to put new specimens into the collection. If it takes you ages to figure out how to do that, then it's a complete waste of time. Right, next slide. 
Okay, now we, we recognize that the collection, the place of a specimen in the collection is not permanent. It will change with new research and new papers that are published. The species can be moved to a different genus um, in, in through research, or a specimen might um, move to a different species if the species is split. So you could have 100 specimens that were all called one name, one species name, and then researchers find that there's actually 16 different species in there, and you have to go and check each specimen and see which of those species it belongs to. Sometimes a whole classification system can be changed, um, and that can be very disruptive. And then also identification of unidentified specimens or re-identifications might mean that specimens are moved. So I'll just put a picture of the dwarf chameleons. I know that they've been split. Um, and so the name that's in the, on, on the label might now be wrong. There might be many more species. And then I think the genus name for the, or some of the aloes has changed. I know that for the tree aloe, like this um, um, aloe barberry or whatever it's called, that one's change. So yeah, that, um, names and classifications change. Next slide. Okay, so the important thing is to have a policy and to have standards for collection organization. So the collection organization system must be documented and you can put it into your collection care policy or you can have a separate policy. But it should be agreed on what system you're going to use. How are you going to organize the collection? It can, your policy statements can be simple. You can just say the collection will be organized according to the following system, whatever system you're using. It could be the catalog of life. It could be your um, particular taxon, whatever they recognize for the birds. It might be bird life. I just use this and I think it's probably wrong. APG3, that's a plant system. And then you would have an annexure where it gives you the, the details of what that actually means. What does that organization look like in your collection? You can have a policy statement that says unidentified specimens must be kept separately from identified specimens at the, at the, um, with the genus or with whatever level they are identified down to. And then you can have a policy statement, and I think everyone has to, the location of each specimen in the collection will be recorded in the collection database. And then you can have another annexure saying what that, what is your way of recording that location that can be in an annexure. If a specimen is moved, so this is a policy statement, if a specimen is moved in the collection, it must be reflected in the specimen database. So that's if it's permanently moved, and you should have a workflow or a procedure for moving specimens. Um, and you document that procedure as a different annexure. And then something we're not going to talk about in detail today, but you, you need a statement about scientific curation. So do you update taxonomy re-identifications in the collection, in the collection database, on the specimen labels? Um, if you do, you need procedures for that, but we'll talk about that in more detail. Next slide. And then recording the location of each specimen. So this would be your annexure. This is a kind of information. So each specimen should have a unique identifier, or sometimes it would be a specimen lot, so a bottle of small little things all collected from. Um, the same place on the same day by the same person, it's a specimen lot. But they should all have a unique identifier, whether it's a barcode or a catalog number. And then you need a way of recording where they are in the collection in your database. And you, a good system would be where you consider each layer of protection, the building, the room, the shelf or cabinet, the drawer, um, or if it's a big jar with lots of smaller vials. So just as an example, in your specimen database, you would reflect which building, which room, which cabinet, which shelf or drawer, um, large number, 
a large dial number. So something like HPWA C62S4, that would be your location. And I just made this up. Could be the herbarium building, wing A, cabinet 62, shell 4. So if anybody wants to find that specimen, they know exactly where to go. If the specimen is permanently moved, you reflect that in the database, but you also include some information. Where, where did it come from? Where was it moved from? Who moved it? When and why was it moved? And then you must make sure that you document that numbering system so that it's consistent. Yeah, uh, Mashlatsi, you do need to have a storage field in the specifier. So I'm sure someone will help you with that. Next slide. Okay, so that's basically everything that we needed to cover today. It's a lot, I recognize that. And in the discussion forum next week, it's on Tuesday next week, not Wednesday. Um, what we'd really like to do is to talk more about storage systems, and more about collection organization and how you record the location of specimens. So what we're going to ask is for any of you, if you want to show your storage system, your cabinets, your compactors, your shelving, your drawers, your bottles, your containers, you can send a photo and we'll compile all of that into a presentation. And each contributor will talk to their contribution and just tell us, it can be very short. This is what our shelving in this institution looks like. We just put this in and it's wonderful. Or we've got a challenge because of this or this or this. So it'll be a, hopefully um, many people contributing. And it doesn't all have to be the good. We, can, we want to be able to see where problems are just to learn from each other. So it can be the good, the bad, and the ugly, not only the brilliant. So that will be one section of the discussion forum. And then we'll also have collection organizations. So anybody who would like to do a five minute presentation to share how, they, or how their collection is organized and, how it's, and or how it's recorded and tracked. Um, it doesn't have to all be perfect, just share with us. So if you can send your photos or, your, or this big combined collection storage presentation to me, or let me know if you want to do a five minute presentation on your collection organization or recording your lo the location of specimens. So I hope that you'll all join us for more discussion about this. It's obviously a really important topic. Um, and we will um, give guidelines for the assignment at the discussion forum next week for the people doing the course. All right, so I think that's the end. If there are any questions, you can, I see that there are some in the Q&A. Let me just open it up. Yeah, so Ian has asked about polytop bottles. So I know polytops are a problem because the, the lids pop out and they don't seal well. So anybody want to help us out here? Unfortunately, Audrey is not here today. I don't think that standard polytops should be used unless you put a, um, that plug in the top of them and you put them into a big bottle. I just um, had bad experience and I, I know that Ezeko have used very good uh, vials, glass vials, but they were imported and they had a very good um, sealing lid. Yeah, I agree. So Ian says the um, regular polytops are disastrous. I've also had very bad experience. High quality ones that Ezeko has are good, but I think they're imported down. So I don't think that they, they are ideal. And um, yeah, if anyone can share with us next week in the, in the discussion forum about how they store small specimens, that would be very useful. Polyurethane shelf padding is more widely advertised and is cheaper than polyethylene. Is it acceptable? So that's from Greg. I think Greg, you would have to check that it's why I think most of these poly things um, are 
acceptable plastics, but you'd have to do a um, proper look at it. Um, there was another question, would you say restraining borders on shelves are necessary even for specimens not in glass containers? I don't think it's as necessary. Um, so if you've got skulls sitting on an open shelf, they are not as vulnerable to falling off as having jars on that shelf. All right, so thanks for those questions. Let's just see um, in the chats. Yeah, so um, Mishlatsi raised the point about having a field in your database for the storage location of your specimens. Um, we need to check that that is in, in the databases, whether it's Brahms or Specify, um, just to allow that. So here Ian says we've got three fields, we need one more. Okay. Yeah, okay. So if you, if you have multiple, if you have for your building, your room, your cabinet, and your shelf, then you may need four. You put them separately. Okay, any other question before we, we close? Storage location, previous location. Oh, okay. All right, I see you. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then you, you only have one field for your um, code. Okay. All right, great. So I think there's quite a lot that, that still needs some discussion next week. Bring questions to the discussion forum, bring suggestions to some of these questions that we've had today. Um, I think this is central to, to the work that all of you do on a daily basis. And so it will be, um, hopefully it will be a good discussion. So if those people who want to contribute can please let me know um, by the end of tomorrow, not later, um, if they're going to be contributing. So yeah, just to close, thanks very much to all of you for participating. You've had a very good um, participation today. Um, and if you have more comments or questions, you can post them on the um, YouTube channel or Facebook page. So thank you. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll see you next week again. Thanks, everybody. Bye.